Well, yesterday at the university, I was really speaking about the wonder of um, culture, uh, human imagination brought into being by a culture, drawing attention to the fact that half the language of the world has just been generation, which means that half of humanity's legacy is slipping away. And this does not have to happen because these societies are not destined to fade away by natural law. In every case, they're being driven out of existence by identifiable forces or factors. And that's actually an optimistic observation because it suggests that if human beings are the agents of cultural destruction, we can be the facilitators of cultural survival. And so really, the question isn't the traditional versus the modern, but what kind of world do we want to live in? A kind of monochromatic world of monotony, or do we want to celebrate a polychromatic world of diversity, recognizing that each of these cultures with their own unique ideas, their different ways of being, uh, bring something remarkable to the kind of council of human knowledge and wisdom, and that collectively we benefit um, by their presence, and that indeed um, every time a vision of life itself is made manifest by cultures disappears, we're, we're losing some part of ourselves. You know, there are very few places in the world where geographic features are so charismatic and so remarkable they sort of draw our attention um, into some visceral, powerful, even spiritual way. And, and one such place lies at the headwaters of three of the most important salmon rivers of British Columbia, uh, the rivers being the Skeena, the Nass, and the Stikin. And by a kind of a wonder of geography, all three of those extraordinarily important rivers are born in the same meadows. And those meadows are known to the First Nations as the sacred headwaters. And each of these rivers is deeply associated, of course, with uh, one or more cultures that collectively cradled the great civilization of the Pacific Northwest coast. The Gitsan with the Suwetan the Carrier, the uh, Nishka on the Nass, the Taltan and Klinkit on the, on the Stikin. And I think in any other part of the world, uh, this area, also known as the Serengeti of Canada, would be protected for the extraordinary populations of wildlife and the simple fact that these are the point, this is the point of origin of our rivers. Uh, the only other place in the world, in fact, where I know something like that occurs is in Tibet, where on the slopes of Mount Kailash, uh, the Indus of Sudle and the Brahmaputra, and I, metaphorically people think of the Ganges being born there as well, and that area is considered so kind of um, sacrosanct to the two to three billion Buddhist Hindus and Jains who live downstream, that not only would you not, you're not allowed to walk on the mountain or climb the mountain, the idea of imposing industrial infrastructure would just sort of be ridiculous, anathema, doom yourself for all time. Uh, in Canada, we treat the land differently, and against the wishes of all the First Nations, there are three major industrial initiatives. One, to uh, put an open pit copper and gold mine producing or processing 30,000 tons of rock day for 30 years on top of a mountain that is home to the largest population of stone sheep in the world, and a mountain that gives birth to no fewer than nine pristine rivers at the headwaters of the Iskit, the main affluent or tributary of the Stikin. This is a copper and gold mine that's being um, pushed by a company called Imperial Metals, and it's not a particularly rich deposit. It's a deposit that cannot go into production without subsidized power. And one of the most unfortunate elements of this issue is the fact that the Canadian taxpayer is not only subsidizing that power to the tune of $400 million, but of that $400 million, $130 million is coming from a fund that had been set up by the federal government, uh, specifically dedicated to finding ways to green our economy. So there's a kind of a cynical irony to the fact that those funds are in fact being used to build a grid into the north such that these mines can become viable simply by plugging into that subsidized source of power. The second major threat to the area is from a company based here in London, Ontario called Fortune Minerals who have claimed uh, some 13,000 hectares of land on top of a rich anthracite deposit and their goal is to literally remove a mountain that is one of the iconic mountains of the sacred headwaters uh, such that they can exploit what they estimate to be several million tons of uh, 
uh, of anthracite coal. By their projections, they hope to be able to produce um, 3 million tons of coal each year, which would imply a 40-ton lorry leaving the sacred headwaters every seven minutes uh, around the clock. The third initiative is perhaps the most invasive of all, and this is a proposal by uh, Shell Canada to extract coal bed methane gas from the headwaters in a network of what could become thousands of wellheads, all linked together by not one but two pipelines, one to remove the water um, that uh, it holds the methane in place in these coal seams, the other to extract the methane gas itself. And coal bed methane uh, extraction is a particularly invasive process because the methane is is inside the anthracite and is held in place by the pressure of water. The water has to be removed often as much as three Olympic swimming pools per, per wellhead. In many cases that water can be highly toxic and creates problems of disposal. And then once the gas is released, um, it has to, the, the wellheads have to be flared until production comes fully online. But more importantly, to facilitate or promote that production, uh, there is something known as fracking, whereby uh, large quantities of chemical mixtures, as much as 350,000 gallons at a time, are injected into the coal seam at high pressure to break up the coal, liberating the gas. But the uh, constituents of those uh, fluids that are injected can be everything from benzene and diesel to a, 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 a plethora of different toxic ingredients. Uh, but that information is proprietorial, so one never knows what is actually being used in any one um, deposit. But what I think it's not just the, the environmental impact, but what a metaphor. I mean, that, that rather than celebrating a place that is, a, is, gives birth to the three salmon rivers of home, we are intending to literally inject it like a junkie, like a hyperdermic syringe with chemical mixes that will of course get into the groundwater and even as the methane itself can migrate as has occurred in coal bed methane deposits in Alberta where, where wells have exploded and farmers can light their tap water on fire as gas has infiltrated or slipped into the uh, aquifers and the sources of water. So, you know, I think it's extraordinary that in Canada we're even considering to do this. And it also touches upon a kind of an interesting theme which is that, you know what, what does it, after all, take to, to establish one of these projects in Canada? You, you cobble together a company, often with no more history than my dog. Uh, you, you secure the subsurface rights to a place you've never been, the stories of which you've never heard, the, the you know, the, the, the sort of the pain of a winter you've never experienced, or the problems of a spring. And even if you've never been to the land yourself, you can secure the right to, by definition, whatever your position is on the project, leave it transformed for all time. And what I find interesting is there's not a single kind of metric in the calculus planning process which rationalizes that event um, that places any value, financial value whatsoever, on the land left alone. It's like it has no value. Or, conversely, places any cost uh, to the rest of us implicit in its transformation and, frankly, in its devastation. And we take that for a given because it's the way that we rationalize the industrialization of the wild, but it's highly unusual when viewed through the anthropological lens. Most cultures don't treat the land in this way. Uh, and certainly the First Nations don't believe that the land should be treated this way because for them, the sacred headwaters is like a nursery for the generations as yet unborn. So we're calling on all Canadians to, to learn about the sacred headwaters and work with us as we attempt not to stop mining because there are many pro uh, projects in the north that have responded to the increase in commodity prices that could be very good mines, provide employment for people for a long time. But there's some places to put mines and some places not to put mines. And to put an oak pit copper and gold mine on top of Tottigan Mountain, especially given that it's such a marginal uh, deposit that it cannot go by the admission of the mining company ahead without a subsidized power, to do that on a mountain that is home to the largest population of stone sheep in the world that anchors a lake chain of nine pristine lakes that would be the obvious epicenter for uh, the, the development of a, of a high-end ecotourism or high-end tourism industry that could easily rival Jasper, Lake Louise, or Banff is, is simply to be short-sighted. 
The international travel business, of which I know a lot, which is at the National Geographic, is a $4.5 trillion global business. The entire capitalization of every mining company in the world is roughly $962 billion. So there's a whole different level of scale to what this country over the long term could yield. And the idea that you would destroy for all time a mountain like Tottegan, right at the epicenter where tourism would flourish if given a chance, is a little bit like mining for oil in the Sistine Chapel. It makes no sense economically, it makes no sense culturally, and it certainly makes no sense nationally. All to do what? To generate perhaps 200 jobs for 20 years and benefit a handful of people who live thousands of miles away from the valley and who will never feel the impact? That's why the Indian people themselves, the Tall Tan First Nations, say, how would you feel if we came and you know, put, put you know, our garbage in your kitchen? How would you feel if we put a toxic tailing pond in your backyard, a pile of riprap in your, on your driveway? Well, that's what these people are doing to replace the, the Indian people for the First Nations. is not a wilderness, but a neighborhood where their families and their ancestors have lived and, and thrived for generations.